A disabled white farmer sues the Biden administration for racial discrimination. The CDC doubles down on summer camp masks for kids. The left wants to keep social media censorship of the right going. Florida strengthens vote integrity and Amtrak Joe lies about Amtrak. A Wisconsin dairy farmer who has two prosthetic legs is suing the Biden administration over what he claims is a racist covid relief plan that disqualifies him because he's white. Man's name is Adam Faust. He filed a federal suit in Green Bay, Wisconsin last week. And what's at the center of this is a Biden COVID-19 stimulus package fund that gives loan forgiveness, but only non-white farmers are eligible. Okay, let's just let's look at this with very clear eyes and let's stick to the facts because it could not be more obvious that this is racial discrimination. It is not possible to have equal protection under the law when your skin color is used against you when it comes to access for federal funds, when that is the only disqualifying factor. We, we are going down to the, the foundations of our legal system here. We're going down to the most basic constitutional uh, promises and protections, and we have to see it as such. And the, the woke left, the Democrat Party, seeks to violate them, seeks to fundamentally transform American society. And that's what this goes to. All right. He this dairy farmer has a herd of uh, 140 Holsteins on his family farm in Chilton, Wisconsin. And there's a four billion dollar program in the covid-19 stimulus plan that is supposed to give loan forgiveness to farmers. Now, now this guy uh, Faust has had more than a share of, of issues and challenges. I mean, he's disabled. So not only is he is he a, a guy who's white, therefore doesn't qualify, but he does actually get some legal benefit. Generally speaking, you know, he'd be covered on the Americans with Disability Act. But see, disability is not a discriminatory fact or it's not a discriminatory um, issue of the law because that's applicable across all racial and ethnic categories, right? If you're in a wheelchair, doesn't matter what gender or gender identity or race you are, you get, you know, uh, handicapped access, for example, right? You have, you have different, uh, some different legal provisions that come into effect. But that's not enough. The fact this guy has two prosthetic legs, one because of an accident, uh, one because he lost one leg in an accident, one leg to diabetes, so he walks on prosthetic legs. He's trying to keep his farm going. He's been through a terrible time with COVID, as so many other farmers have. And he wants government support. He wants help. And our government is saying, sorry, farmer, you're white. Sure, you don't have legs. Sure, you're dealing with disability and have had major challenges because of COVID. And there's money set aside specifically to help farmers like you, except not like you because you're white. This is basic, straightforward, red letter, right in your face, racial discrimination. Now, they can try what they always do. They'll say, oh, it's a holistic and the balancing of history. No, no, it's time we draw a line on this stuff. It's time we say enough is enough. Now, there are woke judges there are progressive activists sitting on the federal bench, a lot of them, especially after the Obama administration. And they're going to be more now because of Joe Biden and the puppeteers around him who tell him what to do. There are going to be a lot of these judges and they don't care what the law is. They think they're creating a utopian society. They think they're creating a better America. Um, but remember that in order to get there, they're willing to break some of the most fundamental legal and and moral uh, protections that we have in our society. This is just as clear as it can be. The government can't say we're not giving you aid money, even though you really need it. The guy's disabled and he's a farmer. 
We're not giving you aid money. We're only giving it to Asian, Hispanic, or black farmers. That is the official position of the Biden administration. Now, you could say, well, this is just one case, but it's not, actually. I mean, it's federal policy, so it really matters. It involves billions of dollars, so it's not a small issue. Four billion dollars might not seem like much when they're throwing around trillions like they're nothing, but in the, in the normal world, in the world where math matters, $4 billion is a lot of money. But what you're seeing here is that the left is trying to get, is trying to go as far as it possibly can. They're drunk with power. They want to see what they can get away with. Conservatism right now is in some level of disarray. We don't have the effective pushback that we should. And so what we're seeing is the weaponization of progressivism and, and political correctness. I mean, they are pushing this further than they ever have before. I mean, if you're a white chef now who makes uh, burritos in Portland, Oregon, you will get death threats and have to shut down your business if the woke finds out about you because of cultural appropriation. That actually happened. You can look up uh, Kooks Burritos in Portland. Actually, no, you can't. It's gone forever. Thanks to a woke mob. That's right. White guy cannot make a burrito. Not allowed, according to the left. So just understand that the Biden administration policy about the white farmer being denied funds is being this is being replicated all throughout our society. Now, there are all these different ways that that whiteness is being singled out and legally punished. And yes, you'd say, but why are all these white progressives pushing for this? Because they view this as creating a coalition of non-white voters that will propel the progressive left into power. So they're willing to sacrifice principles. They're willing to sacrifice constitutional protection, all in the pursuit of, of total political power. So this is a bargain they're, that they're happy to make, and they, it doesn't affect them. So much of what happens with progressives is, yeah, you know, I don't care about higher taxes. You find out, well, that rich you know, that Pelosi, that Schumer, that rich individual isn't going to pay the higher taxes. Got a, got tax attorneys, all kinds of people to take care of that stuff. Um, no, the woke left believes that we are in a country where there's so much white supremacy that uh, chefs can't white chefs can't make pad thai or curry or bibimbap without fear of being canceled. This is utter madness. OK. And you look at other things that have gotten the left uh, upset recently. And, you know, I I think I mentioned this to you. Snow White, the the Snow White rot. Now, the name, you might think the name would be the problem. Oh, why? why? Snow White? White supremacy or something, right? Uh, No, the name isn't the issue. The problem with Snow White is that the handsome prince kisses her out of her slumber, which is technically non-consensual. And so when they reopened in Anaheim, California, a Disney ride that had the Snow White kiss moment shown on a screen, there were writers, I believe, for the San Francisco Chronicle who said that this was this was bad. Effectively, this is perpetuation of rape culture. You know, it's it's like the handsome prince roofied Snow White and then sexually assaulted her while she was passed out. I mean, that's the way the left sees things now. These people are deranged. But this is what happens when you're brainwashed. This is what happens when you no longer have any sense of perspective, anything that that grounds you, that anchors you to objective reality. Uh, There's so many more of these. There was the decision recently by a federal court. This one was amazing. A federal court allowed the lawsuit of Kiran Bhattacharya to go forward against the University of Virginia for expelling him what happened well he was a uva medical student back in 2018 and there was a panel discussion on microaggressions mr bhattacharya asked the assistant dean who was presenting this complete bullcrap about microaggressions whether they only apply to marginalized groups as in blacks and hispanics or to other minority groups as well like indian americans And you would think this is totally reasonable, right? Mr. Bhattacharya doesn't sound like he's somebody who who has white privilege. 
So he just wants to know what the rules are. His actual exchange that came up in the lawsuit. Yeah, follow up question. How do you define marginalized? And who is a marginalized group? Where does that go? I mean, it's very nonspecific. But he said this to the dean presenting this, who is a black female, and she was very, very upset. In fact, she had her colleagues reach out to him right after the panel, and they told Bhattacharya that his questions were antagonistic and aggressive. In fact, they were considered so, that question, considered so aggressive that the University of Virginia Medical School, or just the university in general, decided that he needed to attend anger counseling. That's right. They mandated he attend counseling as a condition of his continued enrollment. He refused. They, they gave him three hours notice, held some kind of tribunal, and kicked his butt out of the school. They even had campus police escort him off campus because he wrote on social media posts that he was innocent and that this was crazy. That was also deemed aggressive and threatening. This is an Indian medical school student who asked some questions of a black female dean at a very prestigious state school about microaggressions. And they responded by saying that he was having a clinical mental health crisis and needed to be escorted off campus and expelled. Just now, a few weeks ago, a federal court said, yeah, you can sue them for that. <laughs> oh, oh, OK. So we haven't completely lost our minds as a society. yet. You can just go on and on and on. All these racial categorizations and the racial balancing and the identity politics, Marxism of the left. It doesn't make any sense when you actually look at it. It doesn't actually hold together. It's self-contradictory. It's absurd. It's wrong. It's immoral. But it is also a very good way to do a couple of things. It keeps people focused on the antagonisms between, you know, between uh, each other instead of at those in charge and the state. And therefore, it also allows for people who are the elites to get away with a whole lot and to continue to be in charge and to underperform and to always just say, well, here's an excuse. It's all just a misdirection, friends, but it undermines our country in very real ways. Do we stand up to it or do we let it to, uh, let it continue? That's the question of the moment right now. The president's view is that um, the major platforms uh, have a responsibility uh, related to the health and safety of all Americans uh, to stop amplifying untrustworthy content, disinformation and misinformation, especially related to COVID-19, vaccinations and elections. And we've seen that over the past several months. Broadly speaking, I'm not placing any blame on any individual or group. We've seen it from a number of sources. Uh, he also supports better privacy protections and a robust antitrust program. So his view is that there's more that needs to be done to ensure that this type of misinformation, disinformation, damaging, sometimes life-threatening information is not going out to the American public. You're saying more that needs to be done. Are there any concerns, though, about uh, First Amendment rights? And where does the White House draw the line on that? Well, look, I think we are, of course, a believer in First Amendment rights. I think what the decisions are that the social media platforms need to make is how they address the disinformation, misinformation, especially related to life-threatening issues like COVID-19 and vaccinations um, that are, are continue to proliferate on their platforms. I mean, they're authoritarian censoring fascists. That's what the Democrats are. They like this. They have no problem with this. There's no there's no principle that they feel is violated by the social media companies shutting down speech that they don't like. I mean, I'm a perfect example of this. I said two months ago, wrote on BuckSexton.com. You can go check it out, uh, which I hope you're checking in on daily to see our, our news stories we're posting there. I said that masking up outside was was stupid as a policy matter. Mask mandates outdoors are dumb. And now every person with, you know, the CDC guidance actually has said, as it has been pointed out to me, that it's really not necessary to wear a mask outside, even if you're not vaccinated. That seems to be getting lost right now, but that is part of the guidance as well. Uh, at least that's what my friend Carol Markowitz, the New York Post, told me yesterday. I was surprised to hear it from her. 
but it is dumb to wear a mask outside. It always has been. But I was censored officially by social media. They they cut off. So a lot of you wouldn't have seen my posts for a, for a week or so. And you wouldn't have seen things that were being shared by me or my uh, my team. And yeah. And, and the, the White House is fine with that. They're fine with it. Oh, it's just a private company. Yeah, we regulate the you know what out of private companies in this country for a whole bunch of reasons. We regulate who they can hire, how they can fire, what they can pay, what they can do, what waste they can have. I mean, we we have regulations all over the place. But but on this on this on on political neutrality or or common carrier legislation. No, no, no. Now all of a sudden the Democrats are steely eyed capitalists. I mean, they're such frauds. It's so obvious what's going on here. But they're terrified of what happens if Trump and the MAGA movement gets back online in a real way. They've had this period of of uh, real supremacy on the Internet now for months. I, I can't say what I really think about masks. Dumb and dumb and useless. Ninety percent, ninety five percent of the time. I can't say that on online or I'll get in trouble. They'll ban me. And you say, oh, well, you know, too bad. I said, well, yeah, but guess what? Th- then they just amplify the voices of the CNN hacks and morons who are out there running propaganda. So we lose. So if, if our conservative voices are getting banned, if conservatives can't have platforms, we lose. It's not just like, oh, the free market will take care of this. No, maybe in 50 years, but in the short run, we're done. And this is why the White House, you'll see this. The Democrats, they try to be quiet about it, but they're terrified. The notion of what happens when the uh, if the Internet becomes a place of free, uh, free exchange of ideas. You know, if you if you had written um, 14, 15 months ago that masks were essential based on the rules that we're, we're told to live under now, you would have been censored because Fauci said that wasn't true. That was wrong. That was misinformation. Isn't it fascinating? These Democrats, these smug, sanctimonious, self-righteous Democrats really think that they know what misinformation is. Just remember this. Whenever you hear these lectures from these idiots like Jen Psaki, not a single journalist or politician was ever kicked off Facebook for trying to negate the results of the 2016 election with four years of absurd, reckless, obvious Russia collusion lies. So in case you are wondering about the ethics of our Internet overlords or their partners in the Democrat Party, we know exactly what's going on. We see them. We understand this. And I just, you know, the the problem I have, I've said this before, liberal billionaires, they want to they want to change society. They want to change the world. They'll blow huge amounts of money to to create their vision of America. Conservative billionaires, what's my ROI? Oh, I don't want I don't want to own that media company or I don't want to build that media platform. What's my ROI? It's one of the reasons we lose. The left cares more. Left wing billionaires, I'm just telling you, they ju- they're more invested in this. R- you know, right wing conservative billionaires just want to make money and be left alone. Lib billionaires the kind of, Because that's what you need to win this fight, folks. You need deep pockets. Lib billionaires? Nah, they're, they're looking to change the world. And that's what's happening. There must be a reckoning by the tech companies for the role that they play in undermining the information ecosystem Uh, that is absolutely essential for the functioning of any democracy. If you get to a point, and we are, if not there, very close to it, where you cannot have agreement on facts, on evidence, on truth, how does a democracy make decisions? And what we've got in the tech world on social media platforms is an algorithm-driven conspiracy rabbit hole that people are enticed to go down and then addicted because it is like watching constant car crashes. You cannot turn away. 
And as someone who has been accused of practically everything you could possibly imagine, I know how powerful this is. I mean, outrageous falsehoods which fuel a sense of alienation. <laughs> Hello? She's back. Every time you think you're free of her, she comes back. Now, Hillary does have some real firsthand knowledge about technology and what it can do for you and how you could say violate the Espionage Act using technology over 100 times and then not face criminal prosecution because James Comey is your little errand boy at the FBI making sure that he's going to have a nice, cozy relationship with the person that he assumes is going to be the next president of the United States. And he's a narcissistic egomaniac. So he makes sure that there can't be prosecution of Hillary by giving some bizarre, completely um, unwarranted speech about how no reasonable prosecutor would bring charges. So, yeah, Hillary certainly knows a thing or two about the misuse of technology. But on a, on a broader level, I, I want to say that the Democrats, this is a, a tactic that they do, that they use. Uh, and it's they take the exact opposite they, they take the exact opposite approach. They come to the polar opposite conclusion of what a reasonable person would under the circumstances. Right. So we see big tech banning a former president, the most recent president of the United States before the current administration has been effectively depersoned on the Internet. That's a big deal. This, this matters. This is not a little thing. He could run again. He could be president again. And if that were to happen, I certainly hope that when people like me are saying, gut big tech, go after them, regulate the you know what out of them, lock it down, get it done. I don't know if people saying, he fights, Buck, leave him alone. He's doing a great job. I want him to do a great job. I wanted him to do a great job when he was in office. It was good. It could have been better. And it would have been a little bit better if there had been stronger voices around him and getting to him to follow through on some of his promises. What, he didn't know about the problems of big tech when he started? But, you know, we had a lot of, a lot of Goldman Sachs uh, advisors around him, a lot, of, a lot of swamp, a lot of celebrity apprentice and his kids. His personnel choices, I don't like it. Don't get mad at me. I, I'm telling you the truth because I like you, because I respect you, because you're my peers, okay? I, that's what I do. I don't sit around, you know, oh, I'm pandering all the time. Ugh, God. It's unbelievable. Um, I, I'm just trying to get to the truth here of what happened and what is happening. And it gets, it gets very frustrating. Because I understand that people can feel like their country is slipping away from them right now. I understand people see the future and it feels a little bit bleak. But it doesn't get better if I just sit here throwing a MAGA hat on saying, everything's great, he's going to come, he's got a plan, he's coming back, it's all going to... No. No. We are in the fight now. We are on defense. So can we, can we strategize? We are on, we're under siege. We're not the ones, you know, lobbing the cannonballs into the fort. We're in the fort. So what do we do? That's the question of the moment. That's how we have to be viewing this and trying to come up with the best path forward is not disloyalty to Trumpism or the GOP or MAGA. It's I want us to win. I want us to win hearts and minds and I want us to win political power and I want us to stop this. Stop this utter madness. But the the exact wrong conclusion. So I, I got diverted for a moment here. The exact wrong conclusion that the Democrats take. Well, it's right in their minds because it goes to their power. But it's not that big tech shouldn't be censoring. You see, it's that it doesn't censor enough. They don't they're not even allowing us to try to pull it back to the center from where it is. They're going even further in the other direction, pulling even harder toward true authoritarian online America. That's the way they want this to be. Oh, you think that you, you make a joke about Nancy Pelosi? You say Nancy Pelosi uh, looks drunk. Oh, not allowed to do that. Remember when somebody made a video of Nancy Pelosi and CNN, some random guy and CNN went and found him and and threatened him and doxed him. Don't ever forget this. 
I, I know it may may seem a little trite, but it's so true. You have to laugh at these people. That doesn't mean you don't take them seriously, but you have to laugh at them too. Make the joke you want to make about them, even if someone around you might take offense to it. All right? Because, I mean, Mark Twain once wrote, against the assault of laughter, nothing can stand. It is so true about the woke left. That's why they have no sense of humor about anything. Because at some level, they're so insecure about some of their most deeply held beliefs. At some level, they're just, they're, they're terrified of having to face the reality of what they think is essential is actually untrue. What they think is critical is absurd. So that's a, a, a weapon you should always keep in your arsenal. Make fun of these absurd absurd libs however you can whenever you can but yeah they're saying that they're, they're not censoring enough on facebook that really is their approach that's really their belief and that is meant to throw you off balance how can they feel that way when we're saying that there should be so much less censorship well because it benefits them obviously think about the effect that this has had we don't even know what the big tech companies were doing before they booted uh, Trump off the Internet, you don't think that they were assisting those campaigns and, and privileging their their fundraising efforts, their news sources and information with the with changes in the algorithm. Oh, sure. We hear all the time about Russia disinformation. That's just all crying, because even with all the built in advantages the Democrats had, they still lost to Trump in 2016. I mean, the fact that they think that. There should be there should be this crackdown on what they call covid misinformation. And and that there's people should face consequences online. Fauci's a moron. Lockdowns didn't work. Mass mandates were utterly pointless based on all the data you can show in this country. But they still feel righteous and blocking people, banning, suspending people who point that out. Um, I was right, and I'm just some guy who does a radio show. Fauci was wrong time and time again. Do I ever get an apology from the Facebook censors? Do I get a, hey, you know, we're sorry about all those times that we shut down your ability to use our platform. I mean, there, there is some level of agreement here, right? It's kind of like, yeah, at a job, you can be an at-will employee, but they can't just, I mean, the guy, if the guy comes in and fires you, because didn't like the color tie you were wearing one day. It's wrongful termination. I mean, there, there's some agreements that are implied by companies operating and, and serving the public. And social media, social media companies have turned into the enemy. They're the enemy. And you'll say, well, Buck, why do I still use them? Um, if I were fighting uh, against, I, was, I don't want to say the Taliban, make this too real. If I were, you know, fighting against the invading barbarian horde, I'm, I'm the consul in, in ancient Rome. I'm fighting against an invading barbarian horde. Uh, I'm going to take their axes and swords that I capture and arm my people with them and use them. So, yes, I'm going to keep using every social media platform I can as long as I can, because I, I do worry. I think eventually they're going to they're going to push me off because I refused on COVID. And for those of you who supported me on this all along, I really appreciate it. I refused to bend the knee. I would not break on this issue. I would not abandon what I truly believed and what I knew from the research that I was doing all along. So, but yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm going to get a, a sorry in time soon. Oh, and, and if you really just, just one more bit here of if you really need to know how important this is to them, the slimiest, I mean, the most unctuous, disgusting, disingenuous, dishonest, I mean, the in some ways, the worst member of the United States Congress, really. Adam Schiff, slimy Schiff, the worst kind of lawyer, the worst kind of prosecutor. This guy's disgraceful. He really wants to make sure that Trump can't get back on Facebook. Play seven. Is Facebook violating Donald Trump's constitutional right to free speech? No, the First Amendment protects uh, Donald Trump and every American from the government regulating speech. It doesn't say that private companies 
need to use their platforms to air patent falsehoods that endanger the country, that incite uh, insurrection. Uh, and so, no, I think Facebook is trying to have a consistent policy. Uh, at least its oversight board is trying to make sure that it is consistent in how it treats people. Um, I, the, the president here is continuing to go out and push the big lie about the election, continuing, I think, to to endanger our democracy by doing that. And so he continues to make the case uh, that he would violate the policies if they readmitted him. Uh, and I think, frankly, pathologically, he's incapable of changing. So this is a temporary ban. It will likely be, uh, if we're fortunate, a permanent ban, because the president is not going to stop the lies about the last election or lies about the next one. He will incite people uh, if that's what's necessary to suit his narrow personal interests. And that should violate uh, any good corporate citizens policies. Yeah, this is about raw power. Democrats have no principles, as you know. They just have the pursuit of power and they fold their principles into that in whatever way they have to, whenever they have to. Uh, they don't care about free speech as a concept or as a principle at all. And Adam Schiff is a disgusting fraud on so many levels. But I hope Republicans remember this. Once we get back into power, it's going to be very hard. They're going to be people who fight it. The big tech companies, they have a lot of money to throw around. They have board seats. They have, they have consulting deals. They have so much money. They'll be able to buy a lot of people off but I don't think they'll buy Trump off. I don't think they'll be able to buy off Ron DeSantis either. And I just hope that we all remember big tech is the enemy of constitutionalism, conservatism, free speech, and freedom in general in this country now. All right, it's like we've imported a portion of communist China into this country to run our communications for the benefit of the statist authoritarian party. I mean, the decision is is very clear insofar as, uh, you know, the board has found that the suspension of uh, former President Trump was necessary to keep people safe, um, that the actions of the former president encouraged and legitimized violence and, and constituted uh, what the board has termed a severe violation of the Facebook rules. That means every Democrat politician in the country that you can think of has also legitimized violence through its support of BLM, which has engaged in countless riots in little mini insurrections in cities all over the country and has resulted in actually murdering people, has resulted in murdering police, which the January 6th riot did not. The only person killed by the acts of individuals that day was Ashley Babbitt, killed by a Capitol Hill police officer, shot in the neck through a locked door. Okay. Um, But. This is the uh, you want to talk, the, the one talk about the big lie here. The big lie is that only Trump statements drive some people to riot. It's, it's only Trump who says things that aren't true. And then people, you know, break the law. Democrats ran around pretending that the president of the United States was a white nationalist for four years. And and then a movement got underway after George Floyd, really the rebirth of a movement. That resulted in hundreds of riots, lots of people killed, the whole thing. It was awful. Awful. But that's not, there's no violence attached to that? So you can't say you think the election was stolen, but you can say, this is social media land now, you can say that cops are racist murderers who get away with killing black men all the time, and it's part of the system, and it's no, and it's, and it's just happening constantly that's a lie but it's spread by blm it's spread all over by democrats you pander and no one does anything about it that's fine you can say that there's no there's no problem with saying cops are racist murderers even though that's resulted in not only riots but also some cops being assassinated i can name some of them for you if you want to know their names ramos and lou here in new york city the nypd Five officers from the Dallas Police Department. That was BLM. It was under the Obama administration, but those were BLM assassinations that occurred. Yeah. You could say, oh, they w- there's no structure of BLM. Well, 
Tell that to all the people marching around that are yelling BLM slogans. But one group is allowed, the other is not. One side's political violence is a threat to democracy. The other side, the Democrat side, much more frequent, much more common political violence is an expression of legitimate grievances about racial inequity. You know, just use all this language to massage what's going on here to make it seem like it's not appalling because it is. This is where we are. This is what we see in our society. We have lies, lies and more lies to deal with. And the people in charge, it's it's not even clear anymore. They know what the truth is. It's certainly clear they don't care. But I'm worried that they've started to really believe their nonsense. I think that they've started to think that the, the, the narratives that they're always pushing on the public might actually be true because they've convinced enough easily misled Americans of them in the first place. But as I've told you, these social media companies, they are the new mainstream media and they are more powerful than the old cable channels and newspapers ever were. They are running addiction machines that are changing Americans' perception about the world around them every second of every day. I think that we saw last summer that there were outbreaks in summer camps and that kids um, had to go home. They had to um, to not attend these summer camps. We're trying to make it possible for these kids to be able to have as normal of a summer as possible. If people are playing tennis and they're they're far away, we can rec- we can say that their masks can come off. But if they're crowded on a soccer field, they're on top of each other, they're heavily breathing. We don't really think that's a good idea right now. These are kids who likely will not be vaccinated. Well, okay. I mean, but doesn't the science say that you're so much less likely to pass it outside at this point? And, and doesn't the, the advantage of kids being able to do things, more things, doesn't that outweigh the very low risk? Um, so, you know, I think not all outside is, is um, the same. So outside playing tennis, outside um, swimming, all of those things where you're far apart from one another. If you have a group of 10 year olds crowded trying to get over a soccer ball and they're all breathing heavily, I think you need to wear a mask because, yes, you mm-hmm. there's decreased um, infection risk outside. But if you're all breathing heavily on top of a singular soccer ball um, that has the potential and we've seen a lot of outbreaks associated with youth sports. I mean, this woman is the director of the CDC, and she's a moron. I don't know what else to tell you. I mean, I I don't enjoy saying things like that, but it's true. She's an idiot. You're going to have kids running around in 90-degree heat in camps playing soccer with a mask on? I mean, does she want want kids to over... I I just want to know, how many kids need to overheat? How many kids need to be at risk of actually having some kind of a a serious adverse health incident from the mask they're wearing in 90 degree weather running outside uh, before the lockdown libs. Let it go. Stop being crazy. She thinks it's a concession. I play a lot of tennis. You're really far from somebody outdoors when you're playing tennis. All right. You're usually probably 60, 70, 80 feet away from them easily. Outside, she's like, well, in that situation, I guess you don't have to wear masks. It's is that even a question? Well, yes, it is because the CDC is so stupid and so incompetent that their initial guy and, and so muddled as well in the guidance. But initially it was, yeah, all outdoor activities. You want kids to wear masks. Kids clear this thing. They are fine. OK, by the time we get into this summer, if someone has chosen not to get vaccinated, that's their choice. That's then on them. And they deal with the risks inherent in it. This is the only way we get back to a normal society, by the way. How many months do we have to have of free vaccines? Come and get them. Come and get them. And, you know, what are we promising? There's perfect safety from covid. We'll never achieve that. But these are people that aren't leaders at the cdc they're they're not they're not coming up with brilliant ideas how many times i really mean this how many times has walensky or fauci said anything that you didn't already know 
Never mind the things that they've said that were stupid, or that you knew were, were made no sense. But how many times you say, wow, I really learned something from, from this thing. They're basically like, there's a virus, it spreads a lot. You know, there's a couple things that we think maybe kind of help, but we don't really know in terms of pre- preventing the spread. And yeah, there we go. That's it. <laughs> there's really nothing that they've come up with all along here. You know, it's so funny. I, I won't even get, there's a kind of a, pro, a pretty prominent left-wing thinker who, who uh, we, we had a, a DM exchange a while ago. And I thought about going back and getting into it. Now. This guy's a, he's a left-wing guy. I don't know how many of you would know him, whatever. He's very wealthy too. And, and he's, he was so surprised at me because I was making fun of the test and trace program and just basically saying test and trace is, is moronic beyond words. It's never going to work. It's not going to do anything. You can never do this on a level where you even get valuable data. And he was just com- incredulous at this idea. What do you mean? We're going to know where the transmission's happening. We're going to know the level of transmission. This is critical to getting there. And this is somebody who's Mr. He's kind of a tech bro and he's in a, and I'm looking at the, I looked at this exchange again. I was looking for something else, and I came upon it. I just realized. So here's the uh, the super rich, data driven tech guy, and here's me, little old Mister Buck, having an exchange about whether this data will even be able to be acquired and whether it will be useful. And I was a hundred percent right, and he was a hundred percent wrong. And that was back in June of last year. It was about almost exactly a year ago now. And there's part of me that wants to go in and say, "Hey, I'm just wondering, do you want to?" Uh, do you want to now just concede that when I said that a government bureaucracy to try to find everyone you've come into contact with who has COVID all across the country when there are hundreds of thousands of cases every single day? Do, do you want to do you want to maybe just say that I was able to reason through this instead of thinking the experts have some brilliant plan? I mean, they just want to. There's so many examples. I went back. I was looking into some of my messages. There's so many people that were just incredulous. They have this need. They just want to believe that there are these super geniuses somewhere who know exactly what to do. And if only we had all listened to them, everything would be fine. If only we had done what Fauci told us. And I'm sitting here saying, we did what that little Stalinist elf told us to do, and it didn't work. That's what actually happened. And people can keep fighting this, and they keep it didn't work. And they don't want to let it go. And they want to keep your kid masked up while he's running around, you know, playing football this summer. And it's just it's just madness. Oh, and while you're dancing, too, here's the mayor of D.C. Yes, D.C. has gone full footloose here. No dancing at weddings. Play one. Here's what's getting a lot of attention. Standing and dancing receptions are not allowed. What good is a wedding without dancing, mayor? And why no dancing? (laughs) <laughs> well, I think there's a lot of good to a wedding, like people starting off their, their lives together and doing it in a safe way uh, and not doing it in a way that puts themselves or their guests in danger. And let me be clear, uh, on May 1st, we were proud of our residents and businesses who made conditions in D.C. such that we can start opening up these facilities. An alternate headline may be, now you can host a wedding uh, in Washington, D.C., a regional meeting. Uh, You can have uh, your friends and family for a family reunion and birthday parties at our hotels and restaurants. And just like our restaurant guidelines suggest is that you have to be uh, seated to uh, enjoy the restaurant. You're supposed to be grateful, you see. You're supposed to be grateful that you now have the legal right to have a wedding in D.C., and shut up about the fact that you're not allowed to dance at your wedding. Be thankful for what they give you. That's the attitude. I mean, I just, I just want to know, you, you have all these people that are, are so weak and cowardly and so easily intimidated by the experts that they just believe all this. They go, you know, whatever we have to do, whatever we have to do, whatever Fauci says, and they just... It's, it's remarkable. And these people are terrifying. As I've said to you, they're like a Milgram experiment. If, if, Fauci told, if Fauci told the people you see still walking outside with two masks that the way to cure COVID was to just continuously electrocute you and put you through excruciating pain, hey, 
Fauci says, got to cure COVID. They would just sit there and press that button and fry you like an egg. You know it and I know it. And that's really unsettling about this country. That's unsettling to see so many of our fellow Americans who are that weak-willed, that incapable of thinking for themselves. There's Mayor Bowser again when asked, okay, well, what if, what if everybody at this wedding we're talking about, what if everyone is vaccinated, right? Then that's, doesn't that mean we're all supposed to be okay? Play two. Mayor, just just is there any way that you would reconsider with masks on and say a, 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 a card that shows fully vaccinated that you'd allow dancing? We're absolutely considering opening more activity uh, as our case rates go down and our vaccination rates go up. And that's in our hotels uh, and that's in our other venues. Yeah. Um, well, what about allowing dancing? <laughs> Can we get an answer to the question? What about that? Can somebody tell us that? No, they won't. They will not. No interest. No interest in telling us that. Friends, this does not end until we make it end. They will continue to do this as much as they want, as long as they want. I, I wonder what it's going to take. It won't happen in blue areas because we're outnumbered and there's crazy Democrats. So I can't lead this charge in, in a place like New York. But, you know, in a place like Florida, if I were living down there, I'd say uh, we're just going to start start walking in places without masks on. OK, they can throw me out. Fine. But noncompliance at some point is just going to be the only way to get past this. I'm talking about vaccinated people now walking in. I'm not wearing a mask anymore. I'm vaccinated. I'm not going to do it. Nope. Nope. They won't. They won't relent. We're going to have to push back. That's where this is. They won't just let it go. They're crazy. These people have lost their minds. Thanks, Fauci, for ruining America and saving no one in the process. 